Do you need reliable and secure IoT connectivity? Then Telia has you covered. Whether you are connecting 10 or 1 million devices, Telia's award-winning network and solutions are tailored to your needs. Trusted by their customers, connecting over half the buses in Sweden and millions of electricity meters across the Nordics. Explore more on business.teliacompany.com. Welcome to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Happy to be here. Thank you, Ryan. Absolutely. Um, so before we jump into our conversation, I'd love it if you give a quick introduction to our audience, just kind of background and experience about yourself and then kind of what the company does. Well, I'm DeFreitas. I'm the Chief Product Officer for VIA. Uh, we're a provider of edge computing and communication devices, applications and services hosted on our edge as a platform service. Think of sort of the business model that Apple established with iOS, having a platform service for developers and third parties to take advantage of a computing connectivity, secure platform, or, or very similar. I've been in the industry, the internet-related industry for about 20 years, mostly on the operator side, and, and happy to be a part of a group and company that's like rethinking the way secure edge internet capabilities come about. How do you kind of cross over into the IoT space or, or I guess maybe work with IoT companies, IoT deployments, solutions? You know, like just talk to us about the impact that IoT technologies are kind of having on those edge industries that, that you're working in and um, just generally how it's affecting things from your perspective? Yeah, well, just a little bit of our where we started. So our founder, Alan Salmasi, is an early founder of Qualcomm. And after he left Qualcomm, he started his own company. Uh, well, he started a few different companies, one being NextWave. It was at that point where he realized that the, the communications, the birth of various communication, the capabilities was going to be constrained without a you know a local capability to take all that information process locally, make independent decisions. And this was well before, you know, the cloud was what it is today and what it claims to be. So with that in mind, I mean that's really where VS started, thinking about okay, how can we take those decisions locally um, and bring the intersection of connectivity and secure computing together in a single platform. That's obviously advantageous to the, the IoT space when you're you know, not uh, beholden to a cloud provider for any type of capability or latency that may result. So talk to me about kind of, I guess, the industries you all focus on and maybe some of the particular kind of use cases that you see crossover with, with what you all do. Um, where Edge is really leading the way and, and IoT is playing a role. Place, you know, like precision farming is one example, but just like kind of give us a high level overview of some of the areas that you see like you see the biggest traction. A big area for us. So we're one of the, the early partners with Honeywell Niagara. So around everything around the connected buildings and enterprise space. So from a secure perspective, as, as you talked about earlier, you know, we have the ability to, to securely connect to the Honeywell's cloud for any type of ESG type capabilities and buildings, also that automation and building. So, um, you know, in the event there is a water leak, you know, we can sort of detect that and then shut down a water valve independent of a cloud, cloud backend or even an internet connection. A lot of, of our capabilities are agnostic to the wireless protocol. So a lot of times we're either over LoRa, Wi-Fi, um, connecting devices and sensors locally, beacon it up to the cloud, but in a lot of cases, just um, making local management decisions. So that's a big area of that vertical, uh, the built spaces, particularly um, in and outside the U.S. I mean, energy is uh, is something we, I think, sort of take for granted here, but if you go to other parts of the world, cost of energy is much higher. We're highly focused in Latin America and uh, have partnerships with CSD or national energy provider of Mexico. And, you know, the demands on the grid there are, are, are much stronger, particularly with all the near shoring. So there's actually um, likely the incentive there for sort of locally managed energy solutions. So that's a, a big focus for us right now. And the, and the third vertical that we're really focused in on is around um, serving the unserved. So you know, the precision agriculture and unserved communities sort of come at hand in hand. So one of the other origins of the company was to rethink how we can provide connectivity for unserved areas that can either use like a Starlink backhaul as we have with our customer in Indonesia, LTE network, and 
examples we have in Mexico, or even a fiber network as we've done in, uh, in Panama. So by taking whatever that call internet capability is available and extending a Wi-Fi canopy to unserved areas to get to a lower cost per byte and a, the broadest range possible. So when it comes to the precision farming, you mentioned how it kind of goes hand in hand with underserved target audiences. How do you all define kind of precision farming and what are the biggest challenges that what you all do in this, this IoT and edge, edge computing really come in and, and help solve? Where we come in, I mean, there's obviously the big, the big players like the John Deere's of the world. We're really there to help the small and mid-sized farmers with affordable solutions. So in these unserved areas where, uh, or underserved areas where there's not a lot of capabilities or internet connections, we can bring that in as well as some basic capabilities on, you know, helping to optimize around water usage and re reduction of fertilizer and waste. So, you know, our business models are pretty flexible in the sense of uh, showing value to, to farmers and then uh, sharing the productivity gains from a sort of revenue perspective. I know there was a, there was a use case we, we had kind of written out that I wanted to ask you about is Trinchero family estates in California. Dive into that a little bit more, talking about kind of how edge computing solutions in, in that vineyards setting, like, cause that's a really interesting example when it comes to precision farming. What are you all doing with that? And, and how is that kind of a good representation of what you all do and, and how connected technologies are kind of working together to provide basically a, a solution to something that, that really hasn't had a solution before. Yeah, and a connected solutions scenario is really taking the best of what's available as far as, you know, you know the, the classic line is, you know, AI and algorithms are born in the cloud and then scale at the edge. So when, for example, for vineyards in California, you know, just being able to take that local ground source data through sensors, optimized with cloud-based technologies. And, you know, we basically have, uh, it's, it's really, it, it's the combination of the sensors as well as like a film that kind of surrounds the crop to optimize um, the sunlight as well as minimize the, the need for water. But it almost creates like a, a vertical sort of greenhouse that takes atmospheric and local condition to then um, promote growth. On the other side of all this, you were talking about kind of the rural connectivity for villages and people that are really underserved in, in other world or other parts of the world. What what are some of the leading use cases that connectivity is being used for, and where is that? Like, what is the big demand to bring connectivity, bring connected technologies into those environments outside of agriculture? Because we already kind of talked about that. But what are other areas you're seeing kind of really lead the way um, from a demand perspective? Yeah, so we have some partnerships that are effective with the sort of unserved, underserved areas. One being telemedicine and telehealth. So there's a, a company work with 19 labs. They are deployed throughout Latin America. We are partnered with them with our Indonesia deployment. So it's effectively like a, a chip that you can do, um, you know, basic diagnostic and, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, basic screening that then is in a private network with an actual either physician on the other end, or a lot of times <clears throat> there's a, you know, a local person that's trained and to use like their the arm cuffs and everything, for example, for uh, blood pressure. So, you know, that's a big one. Um, you know, as you can imagine, well, Indonesia being an extreme example, but like in places of Mexico, like in Mexico, where we also have deployment in unserved areas just outside of Mexico City, you know, having, you know, just basic capabilities to then, you know, save time to get, you know, it would take otherwise to get to an actual uh, hospital or doctor's office. What has the process been like when you go into these rural areas, areas that don't have a lot of access to technology? What is the educational process like for the customers or the even the users? You know, I'm sure there's a lot of challenges that come in when you bring in new technology, bring in IoT connectivity. You bring in, you just solve these kinds of things to help solve a problem that they know they have. But what is that educational process like, even if it's going into working with, you know, ISPs in that area that where IoT technologies and edge computing technologies may be still relatively new to them? How do you kind of handle that? 
We measure success by, you know, three metrics, affordability, accessibility, and adoption. Adoption is really that last piece you mentioned. How do you make it so that when you provide this service or provide connectivity that's actually used and adopted? The first way, you know, is really just to make it really easy as far as the connection goes. I mean, you know, we all join Wi-Fi network and, and things of that matter. Um, but we've come up with a, a novel way to, to reduce the friction as far as connecting to the internet. You know, part of it also is just having a, a local champion um, that can help help customers and, and help um, citizens in an area to understand what's available. A lot of what we find, a lot of people may have already had mobile phones um, for, from various reasons. Um, even in unconnected areas, so they may get it from a city and then bring it back to their area where they may not have connectivity. Um, we also have, you know, some online training materials that sort of helped um, show people what's available in, in the form of those, you know, education and telehealth type services. Absolutely. And are there different security considerations when it comes to kind of getting into these spaces? I assume there's lots of different devices that are going to be used connected to the networks. Well, what are some of the things that need to be really, I guess, what are the you know, top of mind considerations when you're when you're deploying? Yeah, there's a little bit of that um, in different parts of the world. So in Indonesia, for example, security is not an issue. It's, you know, or it's, um, uh, it's effectively a village in Argamukti. Uh, and, you know, it, it actually... Is something that the village looks at as a a tremendous asset. Conversely, in a part of uh, Mexico, outside of Mexico City, you know, it's a little bit trickier there. So we actually have our our Via Hub, which is like effectively like a Wi-Fi access point with local compute and 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 connectivity, as well as a Starlink terminal, sort of behind a cage. So we're partnered there with. DFE. I mentioned them earlier. They're the the national electricity company for all of Mexico. So they have their sort of tower encased in a effectively like a, a gate, kind of like the, you may see like a, a cell site gated. So in that example, where we weren't sure of the situation, uh, El Rey is the, the city, we put it behind a sort of secure area. Another example in Panama, you know, these access points were we're in a, in a location or kind of like right with the light post and, and, and they were fine. Some places are, are trickier than others when it comes to security for both people as well as the equipment. How do you kind of approach and plan the optimization of the connectivity for different use cases, different areas, you know, and then I guess be able to kind of provide that basic support? Really, a lot of it starts with like a site survey where we, there's a lot you can do with things like Google Earth and you can... We identify an area of need, and that may come from a business partner, commercial opportunity, or from a government. From there, we can just do a basic RF design. You know, looking at looking at okay, well, here's the topology of the area. Here are the homes. Here, here are the here's the, the layout of the village. We can do some basic network designs that way, and we generally try to come in with a, a pragmatic approach to reduce the upfront cost from a deployment perspective, but the costs are really our, our via hubs as well as that like backhaul. Um, luckily, the Starlink has come down. We're not exclusively using Starlink, but it, it works the best <laughs> out of us, the other satellite providers we've been working with. So we just generally take a, um, a very pragmatic approach and, and, and we do traffic shaping. So, you know, speeds are really capped under five meg down at a device level. That's another thing that's unique about us. Um, since we have local compute as well as, you know, connectivity, such as a Wi-Fi access point, as a device connects in, you know, we can make decisions to help make that backhaul internet service as equitable across a broad population. We try to keep it as minimalistic as possible and then gradually increase speeds and capacity as, as the needs and demands pick up. How does the device itself impact kind of these decisions around how you're optimizing for connectivity and kind of approaching, you know, the, these these challenges. Yeah, the, the, there is um, some of the devices, as I mentioned, we will connect through, you know, particularly on the, the ag side, a lot of LoRa devices, which, you know, has great range, great capabilities, um, particularly for, you know, you know, a long line of sight, um, 
And we will handle that connection differently than in a consumer device that may need, you know, as we're doing here on a video call um, with lower latency. So, you know, through our application awareness of the applications running uh, on our platform, we can sort of throttle things for appropriately. Ultimately, it's intended to provide the best customer experience for the device or person or place connected to a network. Do you kind of see these areas you're focused on now kind of being, being the leading verticals that, that you're kind of going to focus on approaching going forward over the next, you know, 6, 12, 18 months? Or do you see other areas that are going to start to rise up and really kind of become the focus or maybe even top of mind with new challenges and new use cases where you want to be able to kind of focus your efforts? Yeah, you know, there's, you know, I think roughly a third of the global population does, is unserved or underserved. So if we just think about that, um, that's a big mission of ours. And then with that, how do we help drive productivity, things like agriculture or energy optimization and areas? So we feel like there's a long runway in those three verticals around our ESG type stuff, precision ag and the underserved areas that, uh, you know, there's a lot to that we think we can do. So if our audience wants to learn more, follow up on this conversation, you know, learn more about what you have going on, ask any questions, anything like that, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, well, please just go to via VEEA.com. That's our company's website. And I think there's a, I believe there's a link there to contact us or um, reach out to me on LinkedIn directly. Well, really appreciate your time. Look forward to hopefully having you back sometime in the future and excited to get this out to our audience. I think they're going to find you know, a lot of value in it. Uh, it's really interesting what you have going on. So I uh, appreciate you coming on and kind of sharing with our audience here. Yeah, appreciate the time, Ryan. Thanks very much.